Hello and good morning if you're on the West Coast, uh, good afternoon if you're on the East Coast uh, or in Europe. My name is Noam Shandar. I'm the Vice President of Business Development of Sadara Storage, and I want to thank you for joining this webinar re regarding software-defined storage and the business models that make the most sense for this technology. The way that I would like to structure today's uh, webinar is really on what we think is the definition of SDS, or software-defined storage. And we, we've actually written extensively about this. And what you see here in the bullet list is the summary of what we think are the five criteria that determine whether a given storage product is software-defined or the opposite of software-defined, If in case you've ever ask yourself, what, what is the opposite of software-defined storage? It, we call it hardware-bound storage. So I think it will become more clear as we go along here why, why it is that we think that the opposite of software-defined storage is hardware-bound storage. And we use the following five criteria to uh, judge whether a given product is software-defined or hardware-bound. So it's go, it goes around the cost. It goes around the scalability. It goes around the reliability, it goes around multi-tenancy, and most importantly, around the agility that the product endows on the user of that product. And it's implied, but I'll say it out loud, that the test involves the product, the software-defined product, being better on all five axes than the hardware-bound product. And in this presentation today, I will walk in this order through specifically how we at Zadar Storage implemented software-defined storage, not because we necessarily are trying to say it's the, the best or, and for sure not the only software-defined storage product out there, but that's the one that we are the most familiar with. So we're using ourselves as an example, um, but we are certainly not the only players uh, in this space. Because I'll be using the Zadara product as, as the example to walk through why SDS is better than hardware-bound storage and all of these uh, criteria, I need to define a couple of terms so that I'll, that I'll be using in the presentation. One is VPSA. That's short for Virtual Private Storage Array. And that's what we call our product, the Zadar Storage product. So that's our implementation of software-defined storage. And it's a, it's a software-defined storage product that's available both in public clouds and on-premises. And speaking of on-premises, I'll be using another term uh, that we pronounce Opus, which is short for on-premises as a service. And that's our as-a-service offering for private clouds. And I'm already foreshadowing the fact that we think that software-defined storage should be an as-a-service offering, regardless of where it is. And again, I hope that as you uh, as you uh, view this presentation and and hear my arguments here that you'll uh, you'll come to agree. By the way, a little bit of housekeeping before I dive into the meat of the presentation. There's a questions button uh, at the top of uh, your screen. By all means, please feel free to press it at any time and type in a question. I'll monitor it. Uh, if, um, uh, if it makes sense for me to pause and answer a question in the flow, I will do that. Uh, but for sure, I will, uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll read through the questions and answer them as time permits. And also, at the very end of the presentation, I will show a slide with my contact info. So to the extent that you um, didn't get your question answered or you want to copy the presentation or need anything, anything else from me, by all means, please contact me uh, after the presentation. Okie dokie. Let's get into it. So the first of the five criteria is cost. And as I said, on each of these five criteria, software-defined storage should be better than hardware-bound storage. And if it's not, then, then it raises a question uh, regarding whether the product is software-defined or not. So why should software-defined storage be better cost-wise than, than hardware-bound storage? Well, first is the hardware itself. Uh, hardware-bound storage typically runs on proprietary hardware, and that proprietary hardware is proprietary because it 
uh, is designed for high reliability. And in software-defined storage, the reliability comes from the software. I will cover reliability in, in the next section. So talking, sticking with cost for the time being, software-defined storage should be able to run not only on standard components, but really on the most cost-effective, most uh, mass-produced components available. So in this case, uh, if you look at the, the hardware that VPSA runs on, it's completely standard, off-the-shelf, servers, Intel-based servers, with completely standard drives, be they SSDs or rotating media, completely standard Ethernet, 10 or 40 gigabits uh, using standard switches, standard NICs, standard cables, and so on and so forth. And in our case, uh, also making uh, use where it makes sense of free open source software. All of these things uh, bring the cost down. And there's one more factor that, again, is, is implied, but to state it, state it explicitly, it's a, a, um, a vendor being hardware vendor agnostic. So being able to make the software-defined storage independent of, of the manufacturer of the hardware allows one to select the most cost-effective hardware. And should more cost-effective options become available in the future, to switch to those to those options to further lower the cost of the solution. So uh, mass-produced hardware volume, volume components, and being agnostic to who makes those components um, is a great way to lower the cost. And again, I'll touch on reliability uh, in a moment. Another way to lower costs is with the business model for software-defined storage. So the traditional model where one buys uh, appliances, let's call them, using a, a CapEx or capital expense or capital expenditure model tends to encourage the customer to overpurchase for, for a number of reasons. One is volume discounts only apply if one purchases a sufficiently large capacity. Um, also because, uh, because of the properties of hardware-bound storage, Expansion tends to be both time-consuming uh, in terms of the, the lead times it takes to order additional shelves and drives uh, and can be disruptive depending on the product and depending on the scenario. And also the hardware-bound products uh, have scalability limits that depend on which model one purchases. So they tend to come in different model numbers. They tend to be series. Uh, sometimes they're uh, the, the model numbers, the number of drives that can be attached, sometimes they're, they're uh, arbitrarily selected numbers and uh, that grow, that are larger as the scalability limits go high. But the point is, you don't want to buy too small a controller in the traditional model because if you do, you'll run into the scalability limit and you'll have to buy a larger controller and migrate disruptively the data from the too small controller to the big enough controller. For all of these reasons, the traditional hardware bound model strongly encourages and incentivizes, incentivizes over purchasing and, and also disincentivizes buying what you need at the moment, which means you start with, from the very first moment, you start with too much and you, and you grow, if you grow in large increments. That's, that's inefficient because that's not usually how storage is, is consumed. Storage is consumed um, in usually linear or slightly faster than linear fashion, and it doesn't necessarily have to start with large capacity, and uh, it, um, it can grow from, from rather small to rather large over the course of a number of years. And what I show here is a fictitious example of what that scalability would look like with uh, with a traditional model where one has to start with a large capacity and grow in fairly large increments and not very often because the growth is, takes a long time, is, is complex uh, and, and, and costly, versus the consumption pricing model where one purchases what they need, where one expands and, and shrinks, by the way, as needed, um, and, and also where the ending scale is independent of the starting scale. In other words, one can start a small as they wish, and they can grow uh, as large as they wish uh, with no dependence between the former and the latter. What this does for this fictitious example is that the, the capacity that one actually is using is much, uh, is much less with the picture on the right. The picture on the right has more than 
35% uh, improvement versus the picture on the left. And if one is paying based on consumption, in other words, one is paying based on what one is actually using, then the, of course, their costs go down. If, for, if the price is the same per gigabyte, uh, then costs go down by the 35 or more percent that I just mentioned. But even the prices could actually be a little higher per gigabyte and still uh, provide significant savings versus the uh, traditional model, not to mention agility, and I'll talk about agility in a, in a later section. Um, so, so the pricing model for SDS, because software-defined storage tends to be much more flexible, should also be very flexible or else value is lost in the transactions. In other words, it's, an, it's another way of saying selling new technology using an old business model may not make very much sense. Uh, there's more uh, to be said about cost savings with software-defined storage. Software-defined storage, because of the, of the nature of it, can be remotely monitored and operated, uh, much more so than, than uh, traditional storage, uh, because it's, it's designed to be um, driven by APIs, by automatic commands, um, and so on and so forth. And I'll show you uh, a little bit under the hood in a, in a coming slide. Because of this, and assuming that the, that the, that the storage is uh, remotely managed, then it can be provided as a complete service, right? So it would solve the problems that, uh, that you can see here. So with traditional hardware bound storage. And this is, um, this is a, an aggregation of feedback from customers regarding their experience with with traditional hardware bound storage. What they what they say is that they like what their storage array does for them. In other words, they're great products. They're reliable, they're fast, they're compatible, and they can be configured to run any given application. That's the good. But what one has to do for them can be quite painful. The, we talked about the CapEx model. Uh, because of the CapEx model, because of the rigidity, one requires to plan very carefully and choose very carefully what they purchase, which means that one, one has to spend many, many months planning uh, a product that will be there for many years. Um, we talked about over-purchasing. Uh, also, there's, of course, the day-to-day -day maintenance of the products. There's also the, the occasional disruptive hot fixes, updates, upgrades, and so forth. Uh, and the painful migrations every few years when the product becomes obsolete and needs to be replaced with, with something else. With a properly designed software-defined storage product that is remotely managed, all of these things go away. And I'll talk about uh, reliability, which, which is how one uh, avoids, the, avoids both the uh, disruptiveness of upgrades um, and also the migrations. The bottom line is that software-defined storage again, when done properly, results in lower, not just in lower equipment costs, let's call it that, but also lower personnel costs and or higher efficiency for that, that personnel because that personnel can focus on high value activities rather than uh, tending to the, the upkeep and day-to-day -day maintenance of the storage. So one with SDS, when done correctly, uh, and with a, the right business model, with right business model I mean, uh, a consumption-based business model and a managed business model, the costs go down dramatically. Upfront cost is nothing because it's, it's consumption-based pricing. The ongoing equipment cost is lower because one only pays for what they actually are using, and personnel costs are either lower or, or much more efficient because the personnel isn't dealing with low-value maintenance-type activities and instead dealing with applications, uh, deploying applications and uh, making, making, their, making the company more successful. Moving on to scalability. This is very important to what I just discussed because uh, if one doesn't have to worry about the size of the controller, right, if they're not hardware bound, but rather they can just determine how much capacity they need in order of that, and then if they need more or less change, and if they can grow very large regardless of how small they start, then life is very good and simple and efficient. So uh, in, in, a, uh, in a properly architected software-defined storage product, it should work exactly that way. One would start with as small uh, a capacity as they need. In the Zadara lingo, uh, we talk about uh, storage nodes or SNs, and the minimum number of storage nodes is two. And the maximum is in the many hundreds, and it doesn't matter with how few you started. So you start with, 
whatever you need. Again, minimum of two. If you need more, then we ship we ship you more. And when when you do that, uh, a number of things happen. First, the additional capacity is available non-disruptively. So as soon as the new nodes are connected, the available capacity is larger. And those new nodes came at no charge because consumption pricing dictates that you only pay for what you use. And by definition, the new nodes that arrived at your doorstep are not used uh, and therefore uh, cost you nothing until and unless you grow into them. So that that is extremely flexible, extremely agile, and um, allows one to get get away from the uh, those multi-month planning cycles because if one needs more capacity, no matter how little or how much, they can simply get that uh, that capacity with no no risk um, and also no upfront cost. Let's talk about reliability. I think this is a very very interesting uh, topic because. When SDS is done correctly, it should offer more reliability than the traditional hardware-bound storage products. And that may sound a little counterintuitive because we, we've, I think we've all been conditioned to think that hardware solutions are more reliable than software solutions. And that may have been true in the past and probably was true in the past. But what, what's happening now is that uh, the standard off-the-shelf hardware is so good and software design techniques are also so resilient, as we can see in some of the hyperscale clouds out there, that um, that actually not only is it possible to create software-based products uh, running on completely standard hardware that are more reliable than, than the traditional products, but um, but actually the, we actually see that in real time. We have, we have a track record uh, of um, two and a half years now of um, uninterrupted operations. Um, in in um, in public clouds where where the the usage is very high right? where the systems are used extremely aggressively so and, and let me show you how we do that so uh, <clears throat> the I showed you before what's under the hood it's standard standard servers with directly attached drives and some CPUs and some memory in them well here's what we do. Um, with those resources. So what I'm showing here is the example of uh, two customers or two departments who are taking advantage of the product. So let's start with the first one. Um, where you see the green uh, virtual private storage array, VPSA on the left, it says um, customer department A, and it says baby plus four drives. What that means is that that customer at that point in time requested our smallest controller or Zadara engine in our lingo, uh, and we call that the baby size, where we defined a number of sizes. We give them cute names that start with the letter B. So it's baby, basic, boost, blazing, etc. And there's some some names in the hopper for some larger ones. Um, so uh, in this case, the smallest controller plus four drives. So what you can see is that on the storage node on the left, we've allocated one green core to this customer, and in the middle node, we've also allocated one green core for that customer, and we've arbitrarily picked the left core as the active one, which means that the core on the right is the standby one, which is uh, how we achieve high availability. We've also assigned four drives across four nodes uh, to, to this VPSA. So this VPSA has a couple of cores across two nodes and has four drives across uh, the four nodes. Now, what happens in the event uh, that, let's say, an entire node fails? So, let's say that the that the um, uh, that the leftmost node fails for whatever reason—hardware, software, cable, whatever. So, it's gone. What happens now is, as I mentioned, we have a standby core in the middle node, and what we do is automatically and seamlessly fail over from the active node. From the active controller or engine to the to the standby one. So, from the, from a storage connectivity standpoint, the application keeps running. We also do one more thing. This is software defined storage, so we're able to launch a new standby controller on one of the nodes that didn't fail, on one of the available nodes. So by doing that, we achieve self-healing. So we go back to a fully redundant configuration. This is something not possible with hardware. Hardware is designed to be very, very reliable because it cannot self-heal. 
So it has to be super reliable because should it should it fail, uh, one is in trouble. In this case, because we use software techniques for reliability, then we can actually self-heal. So we use the same failover techniques as hardware with the added reliability of self-healing. Now, we also, in the event that this first node failed, lose that leftmost drive in the A group. But that's okay because we use RAID redundancy across these four drives, which means that that first drive, uh, the loss of that first drive does not cause a loss of access to the data. And again, we can self-heal. We allocate, for example, this would probably be the spare drive on the far right and use that and rebuild the RAID group uh, to return to full redundancy. So that's, that's what happens for uh, customer A with the green virtual private storage array. Customer B comes in, requests VPSA2 with a basic controller, that's a double size controller, with 10 drives, and you can see something very similar happens. Now we assign two cores on the left and two cores on the fourth node from the left, so because it's a bigger controller that needs more resources, and we assign the 10 drives in two groups of five horizontally across the uh, uh, this picture, and the result is, again, full full resilience because should any node fail, there's always uh, uh, there's always protection across the drive, so the loss of any node doesn't cause uh, the the RAID groups to go down. And if a node fails that has the active controller on it, then there's an automatic failover to the standby controller and the launch of a new standby controller to return to full redundancy. So that's that's the resilience that uh, software-based architecture and, and specifically your software-defined storage provides. That is not possible with a uh, with a hardware-bound product. And thanks to that, and I mentioned we have the track record to show that this actually works over the course of of several years. Uh, that's what allows us to provide our customers a 100% data availability service level agreement or SLA. Um, because we know that the system uh, will remain up and running in the face of very serious, uh, very serious failures, and uh, will even heal itself uh, in the face of those issues. All right, let's talk multi-tenancy because you may have noticed in what I just described that there's a very nice isolation among the customers. So because I don't share drives among the, that, those first two customers. Uh, and because I don't share the cores and memory across those first two customers, then those two customers can't interfere with each other. There's nothing that customer one can do to slow down customer two. There's nothing that customer two can do to slow down customer one. And that's true regardless of how many customers there are. So if I add a third customer, the, the same happens. The, that customer gets his or her own drives and his or her own CPU cores and his or her own memory. And again, now these three customers are completely isolated from each other. And even though they're living within the same boxes, in this picture, there are only two storage nodes, and we have three customers. So by definition, they're sharing chassis, if you will. They are not interfering with each other and cannot, and there's nothing that they can do. And, and perhaps even more than that, the customers are not commingling their data which for many customers is rather important. They don't want their bits sitting next to somebody else's bits. Um, and, and even more than that, because we know that they don't share drives, be they SSDs or, or hard drives, rotating drives, because they don't share those with any other customer, they know that they can actually, if needed, take their drives away. For example, let's say that a customer of ours wants to move the data from an East Coast data center to a West Coast data center. Well, they can physically do that by having us move the drives um, and ship them from one location to the other. And by definition, this doesn't affect any other customer, which means we're happy to oblige if that's the customer request. So performance isolation and privacy are two very important things uh, in multi-tenancy and are part of what uh, differentiates multi-tenancy done right from, um, from uh, poor multi-tenancy and uh, is much, much more easily done 
with uh, with software defined products. And really, most of the point is, of course, you could do you could try to do something similar with hardware products, but there but it would not be as flexible. And also, you uh, you would need a pair of controllers, which are very expensive for each customer. And here, because the controllers are software defined and can be rather small, down to a single CPU core, then it's easy to have um, many customers live within a uh, small number of chassis and yet be completely isolated from each other. The result is that customers can be assured that they're completely independent from anything else that's happening in the system, but they can also use that internally. So if you look at this chart, the you have um, three customers with VPSAs numbers 1, 3, and 5, uh, respectively, but you also have uh, the customer at the top right who has two VPSAs. So that customer chose VPSA number two or VPSA number four in order to isolate some things that that customer is doing internally. For example, two applications. Maybe there's an engineering application that's very uh, I.O. intensive, and maybe there is another application, maybe a finance application uh, or ERP that's very I.O. intensive, and the customer at the top right doesn't want those two applications to interfere with each other or slow each other down. Well, it's then it's trivial to create two VPSAs, run application one or A on the first VPSA and application B on the second VPSA, and know for sure that those applications cannot interfere with each other. That's the beauty of, of multi-tenancy done right. And again, it's something that comes from a properly built software-defined storage and something that is not possible with the traditional um, hardware controller-based architecture unless you buy multiple boxes, multiple controllers, which is uh, expensive and inefficient. And all of this together translates to, to agility. And to me, this is the test. If the product endows you, your department, your company with agility, then then it's it's a well defined product well designed product and and a true software defined product if it if it's software defined if it, if you're told that it's software defined but it's not flexible then what you've been doing in the past then then maybe it is software defined maybe it isn't but what good is it what is the what good is it having a software defined product if it behaves just like previous products always have so with regard to agility one should be able to define and change their storage on the fly, so, right? So taking long-term planning out of the equation, and that does a number of things. It saves time. It allows one to focus more on strategic things, like, again, so figuring out how best to serve uh, the, the business goals of the company. But it also does another thing. It allows one to be very responsive to new requests, to unplanned requests. So if, if one is able to define storage arrays in a minute or two and deploy them and run them in that same time frame, then one can react very quickly to new requests. So toward that end, the way that one procures or provisions virtual private storage arrays through a very easy web portal where one uh, would name the VPSA, one would select the size of the Zadar engine, that's the, the line near the middle to select Zadar engine, and these are the different size controllers where uh, we gave them the, the QT names, Baby Basic, Boost Blazing, where, by the way, importantly, one can later change at any, at any point in time to a larger or smaller engine, not disruptively, right? So if I can uh, select a baby controller to begin with and later decide that I need a larger controller, or I would selected a large controller and later I want to change my mind uh, and, change, and go to a smaller controller, I should be able to do that, and I should be able to do that without uh, any interruption to my application. And that's exactly what this does. You can also see that below the Zadar engine selection pull down, there are the drives. So this is where one selects the physical drives that they want for their VPSA in real time. Right, so the, the best of the isolation with the best of agility. So you can get dedicated hardware resources, but uh, in real time, uh, on demand, thanks to, thanks to the software-defined architecture. From the moment one hits submit, uh, it takes only 90 seconds until the VPSA is ready. And what it does is it builds those, that pair of virtual controllers that I showed you before and assigns the 
the drives uh, in, in using those RAID groups that span multiple storage nodes. By the way, the same product is available in a number of public clouds. Because, because the product is so flexible, it's, it's quite ideal for cloud customers who need enterprise-grade storage at places like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Cloud Sigma, Dimension Data, and other clouds around the world. So the, in this way, one is able to use the exact same paradigm to provision the PSAs using using the same dedicated resources, the the Zadar engines with dedicated cores and CPUs, and the physical drives, both SSDs and hard drives, uh, at those uh, public clouds using the same Zadara software running on those same standard servers that I showed uh, in the very beginning of this presentation. So same experience everywhere you go, whether it's on premises or in public clouds or even a um, uh, number of co-location uh, facilities around the world for a total of 31 public locations plus any private location that you want. We get sometimes the question of um, whether the Opus, the on-premises on as a service offering, the same as a flexible lease, which is uh, what uh, many of the traditional storage companies provide. And, and the answer is a resounding no, and I just wanted to highlight that to avoid any confusion, because uh, um, software-defined storage done right should be truly agile and have a consumption model. And whereas a lease is, is a financial arrangement around a traditional model and a traditional solution. So here's, here's why it's different. First of all, the minimum term. Um, leases are measured in years, whereas uh, Opus is a, is a six-month commitment. By the way, on, in, in clouds, in public clouds, the commitment length is just one hour, so it's even more flexible. Um, the, the lease is a fixed, uh, fixed model for base capacity, and a flex lease uh, provides some flexibility above the base capacity, but not below. So one is committed to the base capacity, which is large. Um, the, uh, and, of course, Opus is purely paid for consumption. Because the product is flexible, you only need to order what you need now with Opus. With leases, it's the same hardware-bound storage, so you still have to um, over-provision, uh, as I described in the beginning of the presentation. Expansion is easy with Opus, not easy with the traditional products. I think this next line, fully managed, is should be in big, bold letters because that's the main difference. The Opus is fully managed by Zadara on behalf of the customer, again, because of the software-defined architecture that lets us very easily remotely monitor, uh, manage, operate, um, and keep up the health of the product. Um, proactive price reductions are what you see in clouds and we don't see with the traditional product, and because of our ability to um, to swap the underlying hardware not non-disruptively because of this architecture. So you saw how resilient the architecture is. Well, because one can lose nodes and one can add nodes non-disruptively, it's possible to very easily uh, swap out old hardware for new hardware, and we do that. And when we do that, not only are we providing access to the latest and greatest hardware, but also we deliver proactive price reduction. So one's cost for one's existing capacity goes down without one having to do anything. Um, the cost basis is much lower for all the reasons I mentioned before. It's very affordable hardware uh, using absolutely off-the-shelf mass-produced everything with no proprietary hardware. And the support and the service, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, is included uh, for all of the same reasons that I mentioned before. And those are separate line items uh, with, with other products, and, and including the traditional leases and the flex leases. Okay, so I covered the five um, the five criteria for software-defined storage and how the business model affects um, or connects to uh, to those. And so let me summarize the, the five just for uh, so I can tie it all back together. So uh, software-defined storage should deliver lower cost, both upfront. In fact, with with the uh, consumption model, it's zero upfront but also lower ongoing. And the lower ongoing should be both in terms of what it costs to, to have the, the equipment, the, the product, but also the cost to operate it. Um, and SDS done right will, will hit all of these and improve on all of them. Uh, we have uh, customer, uh, public customer examples 
for example, a company called Realty Data publicly stated that they saved um, uh, at least 50% with Zadara versus uh, one of the top two traditional storage vendors, um, and they did it uh, while improving performance. Um, another company uh, called Farm Intelligence uh, in Minnesota uh, said that, that thanks to their adopting Zadara, they were able to avoid hiring three IT, new IT people. So they, they kept their IT department, but they didn't have to grow it as quickly as they thought they would have to. Uh, the scalability should be larger. Software-defined storage should not have the traditional uh, limitations of controllers. You, today, you can buy controllers that let you grow to, uh, depending which product, some major products grow to 6 petabytes, some to 69 petabytes. It's a function of how many controllers you can string together, and those, that in the best case, are measured in a tens. So you, you may see... Uh, 24, maybe you'll see 36, but that, that's it. Uh, but this thing should grow to hundreds and hundreds of, of nodes uh, if it's software-defined and therefore should translate to hundreds and hundreds of petabytes. Um, and every, everything I write here is true for the Zadara VPSA product. Um, uh, it should be more reliable than the traditional hardware uh, thanks to self-healing, and it should come with a 100% data availability SLA to back that claim of higher reliability. Um, it should have better multi-tenancy than the hardware-bound products. It should support thousands and thousands of tenant and or applications, thanks to performance isolation among those, and it should not compromise any privacy. Each, each tenant should have their own walled garden, if you will, where they feel secure that, that um, by being multi-tenant, they're not giving up anything. And in the Zadar example, uh, we have customers who have certified us as equivalent, functionally equivalent to a standalone hardware array. So that's how, how well um, uh, this particular product is architected. And then, again, I'll, uh, I'll say, really the agility is the point of the whole thing and the, and the ultimate test of whether um, this, is, this is done correctly or not. So agility means elasticity up and down. So there are products that grow more easily, but they don't provide a, a down ramp, an off ramp, should one want to back off and reduce their, their costs. Uh, so, but down, down is part of elasticity. One cannot be claimed to be elastic without the ability to shrink on demand non-disruptively. Uh, one should have, one should offer consumption pricing so that one doesn't have to worry about uh, the cost of over-provisioning, and uh, the commitment should be short-term or even none at all. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for listening um, and for participating in this webinar. Um, I promise my contact information should you need anything from me. Um, in, a, in a moment, I'll look, I uh, see there's one question, uh, so I'll field that. But again, do feel free to contact me as well. Um, post, uh, post this webinar, and I will be uh, happy to respond. I, so let me go to the question, and again, look at, um, uh, look at the uh, top of your screen. There's a questions button. If you have any other uh, things on your mind, please type them in, and I will answer them. The question, uh, the one question so far is, is it possible to share this presentation um, as a PDF? The, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I tried to upload it uh, here as an attachment, but, uh, but failed because I didn't do it uh, soon enough. So the easiest way to do that is uh, email me uh, at the address on your screen or um, direct uh, message me on Twitter using the Twitter handle on your screen. Um, and I will uh, gladly uh, send uh, send a PDF to you. Any any other questions before I uh, um, I bid you goodbye? All right. So I'm not seeing any more questions come in. Again, thank you very much for your time. I hope this was useful for you. Please feel free to contact me. Have a wonderful day, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thanks very much. Goodbye.